Hey guys, I'm about to go head over and interview a retired airline pilot. The guy left everything in the prime of his career to just live the life and be free in Thailand. Left a lot of money on the table. He's going to tell me about uh, some of the costs associated with moving to Thailand and he had some major costs to be able to get this done. Also, he's going to tell me about a few little secrets on the airlines back in the day. One's called the Love Shack on the airplane. We'll get into it. What's up guys, Greeny. Sitting down with one of my subscribers, Scott. Scott recently moved to Thailand. It's been a few months, but he's got a super interesting story. I mean, this guy threw away a lot of money. I wouldn't say threw away, but left a lot of money on the table to just live his life and be free and escape to Thailand. Would you call it an escape? A certain freedom is definitely an operative word. I, I think I said the word freedom more times in the last six months before I left than I had in my whole life before that. It was, the, the walls were coming in, it felt like in the US and freedom was a big part of it. So yeah, so he's got a pretty interesting story. Let's get into it guys. You were a military guy, right? Yeah, I went into the military back in 1988. Uh, was enlisted for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, got into flight officer school, flight school, graduated from flight school in 90. Stayed active duty till 93, went into the reserves until like 96, 97, and then to the airlines from that. Well, when you were in the military, did you come out here to Asia, Southeast Asia? No, Asia was where I, I, I ended up more in Europe. I did okay. uh, like the East Coast, West Coast of the United States. I did uh, Cyprus in the Mediterranean, and I was stationed in Germany for two years. Okay, so you weren't really exposed to Thailand? No, that was all as a tourist later on. Okay. Once you get out of the military, you became a, well, you were a pilot, you were an Apache pilot, right? No, Blackhawk. Blackhawk. Blackhawk oh. helicopter pilot. What's Apache? Is that a different? Is yeah, that that's Marines like a or... two-person attack helicopter, okay. and the Blackhawk is a troop transport helicopter. Okay. All right. Like if you see the movie Black Hawk Down. Yeah, that's... yeah. So did you know any of those guys, that, or was that before, that was way before? Actually, no, those or... were uh, those were guys that were definitely in my kind of age group and stuff, but they were uh, all part of the 160th uh, Special Operations Division. Okay. So the, all those guys would have been a little bit older and a little bit senior to me when they went to Somalia. You got out, and then you went into flying a... Airplane. Yeah, it, it took me about two years to transfer all my radios from helicopters to airplanes. Uh, I did that at American Flyers, a flight school in Dallas, Texas. And uh, that was from like 95 to 97, and then went into the airlines. From 97, and then when did you retire or call it quits with the airlines? Uh, about four months ago. So okay. it was overall, it's just over 32 years in aviation. Let me ask you this before we go too much farther. Right now, they're talking a lot about people sing ufos or <laughs> they, they actually just changed the name recently but did you ever see anything up there that you thought like looked odd like no. just did look that no in fact to the contrary i'm one of those guys that thinks most of the time these are just you know regular i'm not denying ufos or saying what's out there i i have no idea right. but i do know that i've been sitting on a military base and watch an f-14 do a full afterburner climb and i just remember thinking that's why people think they see UFOs, because this guy hit full afterburners off San Clemente Island. And in a matter of three or four seconds, the sound was gone. And in a matter of 10 seconds, no, 20 seconds, the light was gone because he was just gone. Right. And it was an, an ama amount of power and energy that just people who only ride on civilian airplanes can't even fathom. Obviously, flying, you'd been to a lot of places. Had you? Is that, is that how you got your first look at Asia or were you nope. on vacation and decided to come here? Yeah, or how did you? Totally vacation. I just, I just uh, would take advantage of my travel benefits. And, uh, and funny story, my best friend uh, that I flew Blackhawks with in the Army, Patrick, Patrick, say you, buddy. Uh, he and I, this, this was back when the airlines first started giving gay couples like flight benefits uh, because they complained that married couples were getting something they didn't. So the airlines decided that they would let you name one person as your significant other. So I made my best friend my significant other. Oh, and you're he one and of I just guys. went and traveled everywhere. I had heard about that yeah. with the airlines, with getting the, uh, the buddy fare or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so he, in fact, the first time we came to Thailand, 
It was when Delta and Northwest had merged and people didn't know we could use our Delta benefits on Northwest. And uh, we rode to Thailand the first time we had the entire top of a 747 business class all to ourselves. We had our own flight attendant for the whole flight. Wow. We drank a bottle of champagne before we even pushed back. I mean, that was my first trip to Thailand was what year was the best trip ever. About? 07, okay. 08, something like that maybe. Where did you visit in Thailand the first time? Uh, Bangkok, Pattaya, Phuket. Obviously, throughout your travels, you've been a lot of places. Had you been? Was there any other options when you were considering retiring where you thought, well, maybe I'll go here, maybe I'll go there? Absolutely, or, or absolutely. Re- I, in fact, it was really tough to choose between Thailand and the Philippines. Both of them had uh, some huge advantages, disadvantages. Uh, you know, Philippines, everybody speaks English. You drive on the mm-hmm. left-hand side of the road. Uh, it's a little bit cheaper, although housing can be surprisingly expensive there. Uh, so there was several things that were, you can work on a retirement visa there. A yeah, retirement visa, yeah, sure, work if you want, they don't care. Yeah. Uh, Thailand, none of those things are true, right. and certainly Thailand has its uh, downsides, but it's not as third world, no offense, Philippines. Uh, it's I not was as, just there a month ago, I know. I know yeah, that. right, it, exactly. it's not as third world. It's uh, the healthcare in Thailand is really good. Uh, the doctors and stuff like that, you know, when we get older, we need doctors, right? It's just a fact of life. And um, let's just say what the most important thing is. The women. Food. <laughs> no, you, you got one thing on your mind, don't you? The food in Thailand just is so Infinitely far better. superior Infinitely to the better. Philippines. Yeah. Um, yeah. The girls, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. I saw some good looking girls in the Philippines. Obviously, I think. The ratio is better here, but, uh, you know, the people were real nice. Like you said, they speak English, and they seem real nice, everybody, when I was there. But, okay, so you told me when you kind of started making a decision, like, when the big C, the pandemic hit, and, and just your job as a pilot got so much different going places. And tell, tell the audience the, a little bit about how that was when it all started about just being secluded. and The aviation industry has just been in a constant decline from the 70s till now right. from a pi- from an employee's point of view right. not just the pilots probably after 9 11 it hit a big curve there i mean it's those are the spikes and stuff but yeah. no when we when they had deregulation right because back in the old days people that wore suits and you know there was a, only a certain sector of the population went for flights and it was it was a noble profession and blah 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 and then deregulation happened, and then you had your low-cost carriers pop mm, up, yeah. and uh, it started kind of changing the clientele. It changed the customer base. Uh, the airlines, you know, f- had to, to meet all these requirements. Like, if you go to the Aviation Museum in Washington D.C., they've got where they had the flight attendant's uniforms and the flight attendant requirements, and you couldn't be bigger than a size four. You had to be single, oh, yeah. and you know, it's like they had all these different requirements back then. And then things just started changing. And I'm not, in case the ladies were watching this video, I'm not trying to dog any of that stuff out. I'm just using that as an example of how it changed. Mm. During COVID, it was like, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, I I remember a flight I went to in Argentina and the people would literally like jump away from us and they locked us in our hotel rooms for 24 hours until it was time to fly out Mm. because they, they they thought they were gonna burst into flames if they caught COVID. The way government scared their people this place included, was just off the charts. It's funny because I just made a short video just screwing around. Sometimes stupid things will pop into my mind and Fi and I were driving and I said to Fi, I think I made it, maybe I put this on TikTok, my TikTok Greeny Travels. So I said, uh, you know, you ever think about back before 9-11 when you didn't have all these security precautions and everything, like crazy shit that may happen between like maybe a flight attendant and a pilot or just maybe you know when things were just not as serious oh yeah dude it, it, right after 9-11 was a huge factor in that that's when they officially lost their sense of humor right. like we used to hide rubber snakes for the flight attendants to find and stuff like that and now today you'd get fired for that on the that's spot what, that's what i was referring to when i was saying that thigh is basically you know the pilots giving the rubber snake to the yeah flight it, attendant. Those days have you know so, what I mean? so, so changed. No, oh, well, they're all, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, okay, again, <laughs> go, going back to the real old days, there was yeah. an airplane called the L-1011, and it had the cockpit here, 
the passengers were here and it had a luggage compartment right in between. Oh boy. And they used to call that the love shack, you know. So, yeah, things were... For the were, employees, right, not the passengers. Yeah, the right. flight attendants and the pilots, oh, you know? Okay, and then so. the bathroom was the Mile High Club. You guys ever bust anybody, like, any flights that you've been on, you ever bust people in? I think like, one time I had one of my flight attendants tell me the story. But, you know, we got to remember, after 9-11, we don't open that door unless, right, you know, right. yeah, we only yeah, open that yeah, door yeah. to use the restroom. And even then, you know, they got to go through right. their whole procedures of blocking career. and stuff like that. So I think you missed a lot of the fun. You were, I think you were about a decade late. That's what, when I went into law enforcement, I started in like 89. Most of the guys said, oh, you're about 10 years, 15 years too late. Cause it used to be, things used to be crazy. Like people actually used to like the police and yeah. the ladies yeah. actually used to like the police, you know, and then kind of, I saw the progression of people hating it as I did the career. Book. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. That so the love shame. shack. Yeah. That's a that's a good story. <laughs> I'd like to get somebody on my channel that actually was a pilot on the love shack and talk to them. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to be harder and harder to find. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but my, like one of my good friends in flight school, who's a captain at Delta. I did not work at Delta, by the way. I worked for a regional for Delta, and that's how I had Delta benefits. So. Right, right. You've been here four months. I alluded to you in my last video. I don't know if you saw or not. But I was talking about, you know, getting everything ready to, to go anywhere. You know, when you're retiring, to move abroad, everything you had to get ready. And I alluded to a buddy of mine that paid $14,000 to move his German Shepherds to Thailand. And this is, this, is, a, this a, is the guy here. It's tell, absolutely true. Tell them what you had. Tell them everything that was involved in bringing pets abroad. Because I know a lot of my subscribers do have pets. And, and okay, I've, so I've been asked Okay, so whether your pets are enormous like mine, and I know he's going to show you some footage of, of my dogs. Yeah. I've got two giant German Shepherds. Any dog that you want to bring has to go meet all of these vaccination requirements. There is no quarantine when they get here, so that's cool. But they you're basically pre-quarantining, if you will. So you have to get the list from the Thai government that gives you a list of all the dog shots your dog has to take. And the, there has to be a uh, health inspection by your veterinarian. And those things are done in two parts. So you got to start this like six weeks before you plan on leaving. I, on all these things, whether it's OA visas or all of this stuff, whatever amount of time you think it's going to take, double it, okay? I, I can't stress that enough. Otherwise, it gets really stressful towards the end. Um, Proper prior planning prevents poor performance. There That's you go, the, the five I P's of green Five or life. six P's. I may have <laughs> added a P. So once you get all the vaccinations and the health inspections and the tests done, then they send you, a, the veterinarian compiles a form for you, and then you mail that to the USDA, just like you're certifying beef. And you have to FedEx it to them with a prepaid FedEx envelope in there and then that gets shipped back to you and it's only good for 10 days so that's why the fedex envelopes have to go oh, back and yeah. forth and then that form goes gets duct taped to the crate that the dogs get put on oh. and i they right now the airlines won't even let you do it yourself you have to go through a pet broker and uh, the one i went through just kept charging more and more i mean the, the initial quote was like seven grand, and by the time it was all done, it was 14 grand. Didn't you say like something happened where you ended up a day late or something happened with the timeline? The night, okay, so I had, it, I had it all figured out, and a buddy of mine prearranged to take care of the dogs for one night, and then he was going to put them on the plane, and I was going to fly out the day before so I would be here to receive them. Yeah. Uh, and the reason we didn't travel on the same flights is because um, I had already booked my flight on my airline, and the only airline that was doing dogs was KLM. So I actually went across the Pacific to get here and my dogs went across the Atlantic. So like literally the night before, the night before I was supposed to uh, fly out, they switched my dog's reservation. So they're like, oh, we're just moving your dogs up a day. So in this case, I actually launched my dogs before I left. So then I had to jump through hoops at the last minute and pay for a company to receive my dogs in Thailand and house them. So, you know, here I am not knowing, you know, these people and stuff like that, but I worked through that broker and we got people and, wow. you know, I got in just like everybody else. I got in at midnight, so, went and crashed in a hotel for six hours. And then we drove to the, uh, this receiving company. It was a pet receiving company. It's what they do. Right. And, uh, like one of the, you know, like, you know, like so often in Thailand, a lot of people live upstairs from the business yeah, they yeah, work. Yeah. They basically just let my dogs come crash in their family's house oh wow did they all right so let me ask you this when the dogs came over do they give them like a little shot or tranquilize them a little bit no or give in them fact something it's the opposite chill? you can't do that because okay. it's 
affects their ability to deal with the pressures okay. and the respiratory stuff. And then what, they just put a big crate, certain size crate for the size dog and put it in right. like a place so with oxygen? Right, so my female, Gilly, the more blonde of the two dogs you'll see, she fit in the biggest crate you can buy. So like on Amazon, it costs like 270 bucks. But my male is uh, 54 kilos, 115 pounds, and he was too big for that crate. So they had to custom build a wooden crate, which they charged me $1,200 right, for. Right, so that totally added off. to the cost. So there's just things adding up for yeah. you. But you got a unique situation. I mean, most people aren't going to bring, you yeah. know, they may two bring giraffes. one dog, but two, two huge yeah. dogs like that. All right, so you, you came in here. We've been to your house. Now that house, you wanted something where you could make sure you had pets, so you prearranged it, right? I did. I actually met a girl on Tinder who was working as a real estate agent, and she's the one that ended up helping me out. Oh, okay. It's a big house. It's really nice, but you might downsize a little bit next time. Yeah, or? yeah, absolutely. It's. I guess we'll just be honest about the numbers. I, I pay forty thousand baht per year, per month. But it's three bedrooms. Three bedroom, uh, three bath. Right. And it has a pool and a private yard and all that stuff. So and he's it, close to the beach. I mean, he's, yeah, I'm it's one like block there's not the that beach. many subdivisions on this side of Sukhumvit and Jomtien, so he's in a prime area. Yeah, it is definitely a, I mean, I went VIP on this one for my first year to kind of treat myself. Right, right. But yeah, I definitely want to size right. down a little bit. I want to get like a one-story, two-car garage. Shuffling the bike and the truck is just a pain in the butt. You had a great job. Obviously, pilots get paid you know we, we don't need to discuss figures but pilots are you know it's a good job you get well, paid well and you didn't have to leave you could have kept working right oh absolutely yeah and I, you decided what what went into your mind to decide finally like you know because i mean i tell people all the time you know what you can only get so much money or you can keep getting money but you, you know you get older you can't do the same things happiness and sometimes you can say i got enough money i just want to be happy so what what, what was your mindset what 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 was your thought process? A little bit of all those things. Uh, yes, I was actively employed. I was a 767 international captain, wide body instructor pilot, you know, as, as high as you can go in my profession. And um, it was, I, like I said earlier, it just kind of felt like the walls were caving in. It was all the pressures of, I mean, if you think flying nowadays sucks, imagine doing it every day of your life. And then imagine being the guy who's in charge and has to deal with every single problem yeah. that every single person has. And in my case, the company I was working for, we worked with the government and the military. So we're going to, like the average Delta pilot, he travels to the same 10 airports all the time. We're going to a different airport in some different corner of the globe that we've never even heard of. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I went someplace, I'm like, I've never even heard of that. I had to go look it up. I had to go, you know, wow. Google map it to find out where in the world it was. And when you're flying into a place for the first time and you're not familiar with the, you know, the runway and every, I mean, it, that's stressful. I mean, yeah. that's real stressful. Yeah. And you're, you're thinking it's 200 miles an hour with 300 people behind you. So. Yeah. I mean, it, enough, I, I, did a, I did a calculus. It was, um, and as far as the money thing goes, I'm actually very upfront about money. Airline pilots make crap wages for the first 10, 15 years of their life. And it's only when you get to the pinnacle of your of your career that you start making the really good money. But I also was dirt poor for a decade flying regional jets. Right. I kind of and I got to this point where I was making all this money and I didn't even really know how to spend it intelligently. You know, like I mean, we'll tell you later that I have a YouTube channel too. But there's a picture oh, yeah. in one of them uh, where I show all the stuff I sold to come here, and you'll be like, well, you know, Corvettes and campers and boats and. It's like none of it was really making me happy. Right, you're just spending money on things, yeah. not on yourself. Not Retail on, therapy. You know, that's what I found too. Like, it's about living the experience of life, not what you can buy and own. But let me just give you his YouTube channel because Scott kind of history of, of the whole process. Yeah, I really yeah. document. In fact, the first time I looked at a YouTube video, it was this guy sitting on a couch in in Michigan where he had all of his paperwork and he yeah, was showing yeah. us how how to apply for an OA visa which is completely different now by the way it's all digital yeah, yeah. so I kind of watched his progression mm -hmm. and my channel kind of emulates his so it, it's text to tie so t-e-x like texas text text number two right yeah tie t-h-a-i so if you're thinking about you know relocating anywhere but specifically to Thailand but really a lot of the tips can be used anywhere you know, you might get some good insight. And he's, you know, he just started, so he's starting to edit a little bit. And, you know, so I'm sure as you keep going, just like mine, you know, you'll just get smoother and put more things and more cuts and more 
editing and stuff. But right now, the information on it could be valuable for a lot of people. Yeah, know, like I, I documented how to open a bank account, how to get a driver's license, how to buy a car, how to buy a motorcycle. Um, so all of those types of things. And, and they're pretty useful. So like I got to get more health insurance here soon. So I'm just going to go back and I'm going to watch his old video on his health insurance thing. So those YouTube videos that you find, you'll find yourself coming back to them later on mm -hmm. as, a, as a reference. Yeah, it's source. like a reference, a guidebook, you know. And uh, all right, I'm going to start cutting this down. But I wanted to tell you guys, if you have any questions for Scott, I mean, he's, he's lived in America. He's been a pilot. I mean, I have a million questions, but this is just kind of a an initial interview. You know, I did other, my buddy Rob, we did a couple interviews. So kind of initial, you know. Put in the comments any questions you have. If you think I should do another interview, you know, let me know. And, uh, you know, I go through and read a bunch of comments. I remember last time, my buddy Rob, the second time I did an interview, I went through and a lot of people asked questions, you know, about his career. He was an engineer or something. So, uh, yeah, we'll come back and do it yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, I'll leave a link in the couple of, couple of months maybe and uh, give you an update. Or maybe a couple of weeks if there's a lot sure, of questions, sure. if people have questions. So let me know. Okay, any final thoughts? Hey, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm very appreciative of this guy. And if you get a chance, please check out my YouTube channel. See you soon. I'll leave a link in the description. Greeny out. Greeny out. Greeny out. Scott out. Bam. <laughs> <laughs>